NTV Wild Talk in partnership with the Kenya Wildlife Service and Wildlife Direct. Hello and welcome to NTV Wild Talk with me, Smriti Vidyarthi. Today we're coming to you from Fairmont, the Norfolk, here in Nairobi. Now today the conversation focuses on ivory and when we talk about the ivory market, the first country that tends to come to mind is China. But we're going to talk about Japan because it is a major consumer of ivory and this is why it matters. The African elephant, one of the most iconic animals in Africa, non-replaceable and valuable for the continent's biodiversity, tourism and economy. In some parts of the world, however, the elephant is only valuable for its tusks, once removed from the elephant and used to craft into various ivory items. But as the world's leading countries work to close the ivory market as the only solution to resolve poaching of elephants, one country still continues to search for ways to continue the ivory trade. That country is Japan. The Asian nation has been a key ivory consumer for over a century. While the world focused on China's huge ivory consumption, Japan has managed to hide behind all the attention that went to China. Now we discover Japan's ivory secret. Well, joining me now here at Fairmont, the Norfolk, is Iri Yamawaki. She is the co-founder of Tears of the African Elephant. Iri, thank you so much for joining us on NTV Wild Talk. Much appreciated. Hi. <laughs> Iri, Tears for the African Elephant. What is that organization all about? Because when one instantly thinks of that name, it, it almost um, evokes a sense of sadness. Well, Tears of the African Elephant is a non-profit organization and uh, we are based in Japan and in Kenya. Um, my co-founder, she's actually a vet veterinarian uh, based in the Masai Mara. Um, and we are both Japanese. We grew up in Africa and we both have a background in wildlife. And um, a few years ago, we realized that the issue on ivory and poaching of African elephants were becoming too serious to not do anything about it. So we both start, decided that we're going to make a change um, and that was the reason why we started. So what exactly does the organization do? How is it making that change and what kind of a change? Well in Kenya um, we have a community project that we work with the Maasai and we work on the issue of conflict between people and elephants. Um, and in Japan what we do is we focus on the ivory consumption. I mean one of our biggest projects is to, it's called No Ivory Generation project and uh, we're trying to do a lot of events um, through media uh, we do a lot of campaigning um, to get the message across that it's no longer sustainable um, and that consumption of ivory is really fueling um, the poaching on the African side um, so that is our main goal at the moment John. so you are two Japanese women that have lived in Africa and you have come to the realization that hang on the African elephant is too important to be poached for its ivory yeah. but tell us more about the women and men and children all the way in Japan do they also have the same sentiments as you do? Well, you see, that's the thing. Um, Japan is very far away from Africa. Um, I think the fact that the distance and the language is different um, and the culture is different. So very little information about Africa or Kenya comes through to Japan. So most people you would find that the general public do not know that the African elephants are being threatened. Um, the species itself is being threatened at the moment. And, but people still buy ivory without knowing the consequences. So we're trying to get that information out there. Um, and, and how much of a challenge is that? It's very difficult. Um, we, when we first started this, uh, we really wanted this, the harsh 
reality to be out there. So we both have access to the field and the public in Japan. So what we were doing were we were also publicizing a lot of photographs of poached elephants, um, you know, statements by rangers, things like that. But the reality seemed too harsh, too serious, too gory mm. for the public to take in Japan. Um, so we found that we had to kind of ease the, the message a little, um, soften it and make it a more sort of ear and eye friendly package. But doing so, um, we've managed to kind of filtrate ourselves into the general public and we have a lot more people kind of finding interest in what we have to say. So yeah. are you also saying that perhaps by showing them those gory pictures of elephants being slaughtered, yeah. tusks being ripped out of their faces, was too much for them to perhaps bear and it was almost yeah. making them just turn a blind eye to it? Definitely, definitely. Um, the thing with Japan is that you'll find it's very different to the Western uh, media or the Western culture is that a lot of information is filtered so um, they if immediately when you start sending out very strong extreme messages they will associate you as something extreme or radical really? uh, and not something to listen to or look at so we kind of had to turn ourselves into something that they can relate to um, and something that was okay for parents to show children um, and that is exactly what we do. Well how big is the the Japanese market for ivory because as I said earlier when people think of the markets they're thinking of Vietnam, Thailand, China especially, Europe and the United States but now we're hearing of Japan. How big of a market is it really? Well, you see, people don't realize, I think, the big difference between um, the way ivory is used in China and ivory used in Japan is that ivory in China is more of a status. It's a luxury. Um, it's like owning Louis Vuitton. Whereas um, in Japan, it's required for everyday use. In what way? Well, we have this thing called hanko, which is an official signature and everybody has to have a hanko in order to open a bank account to you know close a deal for signing contracts um, if you're buying property or opening a business everybody has to have a hanko stamp wow. um, which is you know you can it doesn't have to be ivory but um, like for example if I was opening a new business and I needed a bank account the first thing I will do is to go and buy hanko from a hanko shop it, there are hanko shops all over town and you go there and you can choose from about 10 different materials um, varying from wood to plastic to marble stone and, and everybody has to have this yeah. by law it is required yes. by law yeah okay. you have to register when you buy your hanko and then you go and register it officially at the municipality then it becomes official so and um, Otherwise, the banks will not accept it. So what you do is when you go to the banks, you, you take your hanko and the certificate to show that you've registered it, that it's an official form of your personal signature. So um, everybody needs one. So Ira, you mentioned though that some hankos are made out of plastic or wood or any other sort of material, but then there are several that are also made out of ivory. Yes. So what happens is you get a choice. You can make it out of plastic. Um, you can choose wood, uh, marble stone, titanium, crystal, and then there's ivory. So if you don't know what you want, um, what happens is you go there and the craftsman will offer you ivory because it will bring good fortune and you will do well in business. Um, and also that the stamp will stamp very clearly. Um, so it's and, but that's the belief. Yes. It's not necessary. It's not true, is it? It's a myth and it's a belief. Yeah. Yeah. So what needs to be become a trend is that it's not cool to have ivory, but at the moment it's you know it's believed that it's good luck to have an ivory hanko, um, you know, rather than a plastic one. Because you probably will make more money than yeah. people tend to think, yeah. or their businesses will will flourish even yeah. better. Yeah. Um, how expensive is it? Can can the ordinary man really afford a, a hanko made out of ivory? Yeah. I think the, the big thing is that 
the majority of the Japanese population is working class and middle class. So we can afford quality things. So, I mean, I'm not saying that everyone can buy expensive ivory, but there are also very cheap ones as well, ranging from about $20 to $30 to up to about $400. So, I mean, you have a choice within ivory material, um, but also that a lot of people can actually afford it. But it's not that a lot of people don't always think, oh, ivory is good luck, so I have to go and buy ivory. It's more like you don't really think about it until the time comes to buy a hanko. And when you're told that it's good, it's good luck to buy mm -hmm. it, you would rather buy something that's good luck rather than of, yeah, of no fortune. So um, I think the, the big thing, the, the biggest problem is that people don't know the connection between buying that particular hanko ivory and what it does to the African elephants. Can Japanese people tell the difference at all between perhaps fake hanko ivory and, and real hanko? Um, not really. I mean, once you seal the stamp, it doesn't matter whether it came from a plastic one or an, I or an ivory hanko. Um, but I think the biggest problem is that the registration system of legal ivory in Japan ha is infested with loopholes. So there is no ways for a consumer to be able to tell the difference between legal and illegal ivory. So they don't know, you know, even though most people believe, but ivory is legal in Japan. What is the big problem? But most people don't know that a lot of the the illegal ivory there's no way of telling the difference so it's not completely safe and what does hanko look like does it look like just an ordinary stamp could you describe it to us it's actually this big almost like half the length of a pen mm -hmm. um, and the diameter is about a centimeter 1.2 centimeters and on the surface is your surname carved um, it could be your surname and your surname and your first name or just your first name whatever that you register it um, it will be accepted as your form of seals and no doubt you have a hanko as well yes, what's yours made out of mine is made of wood okay yeah. all right and, and and i'm sure fortunes are, are as good as they they ever would be <laughs> if even if whether it was ivory or not um, so therefore there is a big uh, a big market um, but is ivory used for anything else in Japan or is it yes. mainly for hanko? Well, 80% of the ivory used in Japan is um, for hanko, but also we use it in traditional music. I mean, it has been used for over a century. Um, it goes back to the Edo era when, you know, things first started coming in from overseas. Um, it's used in a Japanese instrument called shamisen um, as a, it's like a pick. Um, it's a string instrument and it's a pick and um, one, only one pick can be made out of one tusk. Yes. Really? So it's very expensive um, and the people actually use it, the population who actually do traditional music is very small. So it's a lot more, the, the ivory consumed by the general public as hanko is a lot more significant than the ivory consumed by traditional music. How is it and why do you think that the world at large doesn't really know that Japan is a big consumer of ivory? Because the, the highlights have always been on countries such as China and um, the USA or Europe. Well, I think there are two big reasons. I think one is that China's had all the attention, so and they are the biggest uh, consumer of ivory. So I think Japan's been able to get away with getting that attention. Um, I think the second thing is that um, when Japan laid down its rules, registration of legal ivory uh, for domestic use, um, it, there weren't so many problems in terms of ivory, ivory that is connected to corruption, crime, and you know, for example, terrorism. But now the world has changed over the last 30 years so they really do need to revise the registration rules um, instead of basing it on what they made decisions on back in the 80s. What do you think needs to change in Japan in order to fix this problem and make people realize that actually if you want to buy a hanko for example it doesn't have to be made out of ivory? Well the, I think the biggest thing is to let people know. Um, I think it's well, Japan as a country, do they don't believe that our registration is infested with loopholes. So, you know, coming from the official side, they will never try to send strong messages out to the public saying that, hey, watch out for what you buy. In, but in fact, you do need to be careful. So I think um, people need to know that 
there is no different there is no way of telling the difference between legal and illegal ivory at the moment so they they really shouldn't buy it at the moment yeah well ivory what are some of these loopholes that you're talking about well it's actually horrifying. Um, it's very easy to register um, ivory um, in Japan. I mean, you could do it, I could do it. Um, really? Yes. And only whole tusks need to be registered. So first of all, if I had a whole tusk that um, I wanted to register and I wanted to trade it, um, only then do I need to register it. Um, and what I will need to do is to get a statement from a non-family member to back up my story. So you don't even have to prove the origin of the tusk. Mm -hmm. So what I will need to do is I will take a photograph of the whole tusk um, and I will make, write a statement saying that I inherited from my grandfather and I will ask maybe pay my neighbour some pocket money to, to ask her to say that maybe she saw it back in the 80s um, my grandfather carrying that whole tusk in the backyard and um, that is how I could get it registered and furthermore I mean if the tusk is chopped into a piece less than a kilogram you don't need to register it at all. Really? And the whole tusk that is actually registered, there's no marking on the tusk itself. So you can use that registration paper for another tusk. Over and over yeah. again. Oh my goodness me, it's that easy yes. and it is so, so shocking. So clearly laws need to change. So who is responsible to, to enact this change? Is it the, the government of Japan? Yes, they actually need to accept that the system does not work. Um, whereas, you know, I have spoken to the ministry last year, the Ministry of Environment, and they were quite sure that it was working fine. Um, but this system has been repeatedly criticised um, from different organisations overseas, um, and it really needs to be looked into. Yeah. All right, so a lot needs to be done then on Japan's end. And we'll talk a little bit more about um, what your organization is doing in terms of trying to help that change. But it is time for a quick breather on NTV Wild Talk. I am joined here by Airi Yamawaki. She is the co-founder of Tears of the African Elephant. And that is an organization based in Japan, but also based here in Kenya. The conversation today focusing on Japan's role as a consumer of ivory and the impact that it's having on our African elephant. Remember, you can chime into the conversation using the hashtag NTVWild on Twitter or log on to our Facebook page, like it, and it is NTVWild. Now, though, it is time for your wild guests. And remember, we are coming to you from Fairmont, the Norfolk, here in Nairobi. Here is your wild guest question. Why do many people in Japan opt to buy hanko made out of ivory? Why do many people in Japan opt to buy hanko made out of ivory? Remember, our entry rules for wild guests have changed. Now, to participate, you must like the NTV Wild Facebook page and post your answer on the timeline associated with this question. Answers sent via Twitter will unfortunately no longer be considered. The first person to answer correctly wins a delicious brunch for four people at the Lord Delamere Terrace at the Fairmont The Norfolk. The winner also gets one bottle of wine courtesy of Wines of the World and a gift hamper courtesy of Wildlife Direct. Terms and conditions apply which can be found on the NTV Wild Facebook page. Last week's lucky winner was Oliver Kibet. So my conversation continues now with Airi Yamawaki. She is the co-founder of Tears of the African Elephant. Our conversation today focusing on Japan as a nation that consumes ivory. Airi, some shocking facts that you've revealed to us about Japan's role um, as a market for ivory. We were talking before the break about um, the loopholes, um, the lack of knowledge amongst the Japanese people about um, the, the ivory issue and of course what needs to be done. Uh, the government of Japan needs to act. Is there enough noise being made by various NGOs, for example, or, or people who do have the knowledge in Japan itself? Well, the thing is, you know, we are about the only functional and active organization who is actively involved in pub public campaigning about this issue. Um, there is another organization who works on the legal issues, um, who works in a very uh, close partnership with an organization overseas. But when it comes to public, 
um, we're about the only guys doing it. Yeah. Really? Yes. And why, why do you think that is? Well, I think it's because it's such a far away issue. Um, and, you know, I think it's very difficult for people to realize that it, it is something that related to them. So it ha it's, it's not very well known. Um, so I think it's in the past, it's, people have spoken about it, but not done serious amount of work for it. Well, it makes me think that you and your organization have a lot of work to do, therefore. Um, let's talk a little bit about Japan's role and um, where they stand when it comes to the trade yes. in ivory yeah. across the borders. We know that many countries now mm. are calling for the end of yeah. ivory trade. What does Japan stand? Well, I mean, based on my communication with the Director of Biodiversity in the Ministry of Environment, it was very clear that Japan believes ivory is sustainable um, and that the money that they use to buy ivory in the future for, uh, from Africa will help poverty and conservation of elephants. Um, they have used examples of success stories in Botswana and they firmly believed that, that the same story will apply to Zimbabwe and hence they are supporting them. Um, yeah, so I think there's a lot of, there's a huge gap in information in what they believe and understand about Africa. Um, and there is very little information available for them. And I think um, the key people involved on the government side, um, they really need to involve more people who are, who knows Africa very well, I think. Yeah. So what you're saying is that Japan is for the trade in ivory yes. and it backs a country like Zimbabwe. Yes. Yes. Goodness me, that, that, that is pretty shocking. Um, well, what, what needs to be done in Japan? We've said that the government needs to act. On our part though, the country that has all the elephants, what do you think we need to do? Because we know that, look, uh, Kenya and China, for example, have very close ties. Yes. And um, it has been said that Kenya therefore needs to make use of those ties and speak to uh, the relevant government in China and make them aware that look at what uh, the buying of ivory in your country is doing to our African elephants. Does Kenya and Japan have that same sort of a relationship? Well, I think in general, um, Kenya and Japan has always had a very good relationship. Um, historically, Japan's always been involved in developing um, parts of Kenya. Um, in business-wise, I'm sure they contribute a lot. Um, and I think with TCAD, the Tokyo International Conference of African Development coming up in August, it is it would be a fantastic opportunity for the leader in conservation, the leader of, of Kenya, who is a leader in conservation, to speak to the leader of an ivory consuming country face to face about this issue. I mean, I think because they are on a friendly term, it should be easier. And, you know, coming first hand from the country itself where it's suffering um, with problems on African elephants, it would mean a lot more. It would be a stronger message than us trying to do public campaigns in Japan. Well, TCAD, of course, is coming up right here in Nairobi. As Irie has said, it is a conference between uh, Japan and Kenya. So definitely an opportunity for the two countries to discuss this issue. Uh, that is about ivory consumption in Japan. And that's happening towards the end of August. Um, what? How much of a missed opportunity will it be if the government of Kenya doesn't acknowledge and address this issue and put it on the table with Japan? Well, I think it will be um, just detrimental, I think, because we all know that the issue of the African elephant is very big this year. Everybody is talking about it. Um, America, like you said, America, uh, China, many of the countries are, including the African Elephant Coalition, they are trying to work together to try and close the ivory market and with CITES coming up next month. So um, it is the right time. Um, there would be no other best time. It wouldn't be the same next year. Um, and, you know, with two countries being involved, we don't know what the political situations will be. So, I mean, there's no better opportunity than TCAD. Right. And what else is set to be discussed during TCAD? Does it um, touch on any sort of environmental or business issues? It's mainly normally on business issues. Um, and the, the conference itself is aimed at developing African countries um, with Tokyo, well, Japan being involved. Yeah.
What was Japan's view, do you know, about uh, the burning of tons and tons of ivory that we had here a few months ago in Kenya? Well, I mean, it was a big enough news to be taken up on the news in Japan. We rarely hear uh, news on elephants in Japan. Um, we've also had responses from our followers um, because we do give out information as well. And we had some people say, wow, you know, um, it's such a huge move. But then again, we also had people saying, why couldn't they just crush it and not burn it because of the, the carbon dioxide that was given off? Uh, but I think those are very extremely conscious, environmentally conscious people. But um, I think but most of the responses we had was like, wow, you know, Kenya's letting go of the financial value of this ivory and it's a huge message. Yeah. Wow. And um, do you think it created any sort of impact in Japan? Because Kenya's, partly Kenya's reason for burning and destroying that ivory was to send out a strong message that we over here will not tolerate ivory um, unless it is on a living elephant. And we wanted that message to be spread around the world. Is that how it was taken in Japan? I think yes. Um, probably better than not doing it um, because I think it was taken up it was definitely taken up on the news so um, a lot of the public actually saw it and because that visual is still left in the people's minds again um, it is the right time for the two leaders of our countries to, to discuss this while it's fresh in their mind. It certainly yeah. is but tell us more now about um, the organization yeah. um, tears of the African elephant. As this issue of ivory and the consumption of it in Japan perhaps grows or nothing is changing, it's not improving at all, um, what is your plan for the future? Well, I mean, our, our ultimate goal is to secure the future for elephants and we also work with rhinos as well, but to secure the future of these wild, wildlife. And what we try to do is um, we work a lot with the public in Japan. Uh, we have a project called the No Ivory Generation Project. Um, we published a book um, about uh, this elephant called Lima, the tuskless elephant. And we use this book, um, it was published by NHK, and we use this book to try and get the message across. It's an opportunity for children to learn about, uh, not just about ele elephants and elephant behavior, but also about the different ecology in Africa. Um, and also about this issue revolving around elephants. And we've managed to donate it to more than 3,000 schools. Wow. Um, and we're hoping by the end of August it would reach to over 5,000 schools. And we also run workshops for children, um, you know, teaching them about animals in Africa. Um, so we do that. We, all, we also la launched a campaign for Rhino Horn as well. I mean, we are sitting in Asia, so we thought, you know, we could do some um, work on rhinos as well. Um, so I think we, we hope that by sending the message across to children to create an entire generation of kids who believe that ivory is not required, we could push out the demand. Um, I think that's the only way. It's very difficult to change the law. It's very difficult to change a country. But I think by changing public awareness, um, you don't need to change the law. And by, you know, getting rid of the value, the monetary value that sticks to ivory. Um, we are hoping that that will contribute to a no ivory world. Well Ari, of course, focusing on the children first um, is a very, very important step because that's pretty much where it all starts. But governments also have a huge role. Now when we talk about CITES that's yeah. coming up and Japan, what is the connection? Well, Japan still believes that ivory is a sustainable resource and they are, are looking for another opportunity to buy more stock of ivory. Um, but when it comes to CITES, I think they will probably quietly observe what happens to Zimbabwe and Namibia, um, hoping for the best that the trade will be approved. Um, that is, I think, where they stand. I think it's very important um, to make a difference. The big step with for them to kind of acknowledge that they shouldn't be buying further ivory. Um, I think it's very unrealistic to try and ban it overnight because we do have, uh, it's been used traditionally, um, it's been there for a long time and we do have people who live, make a living off it. So it has to be a gradual process but I think the country itself needs to acknowledge that it has to be done even if it's gradually.
Yeah. yeah, it definitely has to be done. And as you say, that education aspect yeah. and awareness, what you're doing, um, your organization is so, so key. Um, how long has the organization Tears of the African Elephant been in existence for? Well, I mean, we started in at the end of 2011. When we saw, when we started seeing that the number of elephants shot up after 2010, that's when we were starting, when we started discussing about making a difference. And when it, when it was 2012, we were not going to sit back anymore and we decided, no, it's time to take action. So that's when we started really working hard um, on this issue. Why did you, as Irie, choose to do this? How did you get involved? I mean, you're a Japanese woman and you're telling us about um, what people believe in Japan, but obviously you know differently. What do elephants mean to you? Why do they matter? Well, I mean, I grew up in South Africa. Um, and I studied zoology um, at university level and wildlife has been very close to me. Um, my first profession was to work um, in the filming industry in making wildlife documentaries. Um, so I've traveled extensively across Africa. As a child, I was in and out of game reserves all the time in South Africa. And elephants have always been a huge, huge part of me. Um, I cannot imagine Africa without elephants. But then again, I don't do this because for the love of elephants. It's because we have to. Um, people think that we do this because we just you know, You're someone love that elephants. <laughs> yeah. but it's really because we have to conserve them and the same applies for my partner in Kenya she's she's also grew, she grew up in in Africa and she also understands as a species the roles that it plays in Africa um, so we both firmly believe that it's more than just say, being biased towards the animal it's really it's about conserving the ecology of 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 Africa. And when you talk about conserving the ecology of Africa, what's the ecology of Japan? You know, <laughs> a lot of people watching might yeah. think, oh, those guys, you know, they're after our, our elephants. We have all the nature here. But describe to us what, what is Japan like? Well, you know, more than 70% of our land is mountain and we do have a lot of beautiful nature. Um, we have a lot of bird life. We do have some large mammals like bears um, and, uh, and deers, and, um, but not so much like Africa. It's not really the same, but we do have some spectacular uh, reserves in Japan as well. Uh, and you can only imagine how people over there might feel if the same that's happening to our African elephants here uh, was to happen to some of their precious wildlife in Japan. Irie, what is your view of um, the future? I mean, are you optimistic when you think about the, the consumption of ivory in Japan and the future of the African elephant? Yes, well, I firmly believe that the Japanese are very sort of very kind, caring people um, and also we have a high level of education. So I think it's just a matter of getting the message across, having that message available to the public um, and making a difference in their mindset because once they know the, res the responses we get is, oh my gosh, we have to do something. So it's just a matter of, you know, getting the message across and I I'm very hopeful that if we can um, have that message across to the general public, it'll make a huge difference. And what next for your organization? Because you are doing some work here in the Masai Mara. How does that connect to, to ivory and elephants? Well, I mean, you cannot protect uh, wildlife without being involved with the community. They are part of the, that ecosystem. And we always tell people in Japan that conserving an animal does not mean having a a ranger with a rifle standing next to the animal. It's about conserving the entire environment. Um, so the work that we are doing in the Maasai area, we're trying to address the issue of animal-human conflict. We've introduced beekeeping um, with the support of uh, Mitsui, it's a Japanese company. And um, we're trying to get the Maasai to learn that by beekeeping, they have the benefit of um, financial benefit from the honey. So they don't need to chop down the trees um, of the forest. That they they believe is sacred to them as well. So we're hoping that we could do a lot more work with that as well. But Irie, as much as you say that, um, you are one organization trying to do a lot and there's not that many organizations in Japan um, campaigning for that same message. So clearly more people need to be made aware. What is it that perhaps us here in Kenya can do to help the situation? 
Well, firstly would be asking your president to um, send that message using TCAD as an opportunity. Um, I am hoping that, that, that I think the development and the spread of SNS will make the two countries closer, and not just Kenya and Japan, but between Africa and Japan. And I really do hope that, you know, more people in Japan will be interested in, in what's being um, coming out of Africa. So certainly that is a very important point. We have a role here to push our own government to make sure that they connect to Japan and pass on that message that, hey, stop with the ivory. These are our elephants. And really, there are elephants, but they belong to all of us as well um, as living elephants. So we have a role to play here. It's not only up to organizations and the people in Japan to change as well. So you're optimistic about the future. Yes, I am. I really do hope so. I believe that people in Japan can make a difference. Yeah. All right, so plenty of work to do for yes. you both here and in yes. Japan. Yeah. All right, Irie, I believe you are on the right track. Thank you so much for bringing this very important issue to light. I'm sure that many people did perhaps not know how involved Japan is in, in the, the interest in ivory. Um, but of course, that your organization and a few others are trying to change that. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, joining me on NTV Wild Talk, Irie Yamawaki. She is the co-founder of Tears of the African Elephant, an organization that is doing its utmost to create awareness in Japan about the importance of conserving the African elephant. This is NTV Wild Talk. I certainly hope you've been participating in the show using the hashtag NTV Wild and also liking our Facebook page and posting your comments about the show over there. For now, we are shifting focus it's time for our wild pick segment where you send in photos that demonstrate that you love nature and the environment here are some of your photos Abraham Jenga was in old joggy standing in front of an elephant and holding a message to the world that says faith cares for nature he's an animal rights activist and says conservation is our responsibility despite religion race culture or ethnicity this is a snap of Ruth Parsime taken at the Namanga River Lodge. She was feeding a baby antelope some milk because the baby antelope was orphaned. Taken at the David Sheldrick Elephant Orphanage, this is Victor Huria snapping a selfie of himself, saying that he was creating awareness against poaching of our elephants. And back in Old Joggy, this is Clifford Kimathi now, who was on a family trip and says that he just loves the wild and mostly elephants. And this is a snap of Eli Chep taken at the Treetops Lodge in the Abadares in Nyeri. Eli was enjoying an aerial game view of flora and fauna and was on a safari getaway with his fiancée Eve. He says it was amazing to see how elephants feed and socialise in groups. If you want your photo showcased on our Wild Pick segment, just like our NTV Wild Facebook page and send a photo that shows you celebrating nature via private message. Include your full name, tell us where the photo was taken, what you were doing and why. The Tokyo International Conference for African Development, TICAD, is taking place on the 27th and 28th of August here in Nairobi. Now, Kenya must make the most of this opportunity by speaking to the Japanese government about Japan's consumption of ivory and the loopholes in the registration surrounding it that can be abused by the illegal trade. Well, that's it on NTV Wild Talk with me, Smriti Vidyarthi, coming to you today from Fairmont, the Norfolk, here in Nairobi, that have accommodated us for this shoot. Thanks very much for watching. We'll see you again next Tuesday, 10 p.m. Fairmont to the Norfolk. Are you scared of cats? Really? Oh! Okay. As if we're talking. Okay, yeah. Yeah. So, Fidel, yeah. just take a few, then just show me. Yeah. Off you trot. But what do you do for f shoots with lions? Are you okay with lions? You know, I'm fine with lions oh, and, and, and chickens <laughs> and cats. Good, I'm <laughs> <laughs>
NTV Wild Talk in partnership with the Kenya Wildlife Service and Wildlife Direct.